I miss the midget, I always find it strange. You know, when I come, I have a good one on the and teach a meditation retreat. I always turn on the aircon in my room to the minimum temperature, because I like it cool. And even here, it's a bit warm, but I still people see people with uh, hoods on and scarves on, and that's okay, that's okay, look, look, please be comfortable. It's just that sometimes I can't understand why you're wearing a beanie. But if it's comfortable for you, please wear them. It's just that I come from a cold country. I was born in a cold country, so I'm used to cold weather. So much so. Oh. <laughs> so much so that, you know, when I was in Norway just a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the lovely experiences there was walking out into the snow. I did wear shoes, but I didn't wear any socks. I never had any socks. You don't need any socks. Just you now my feet are just more than warm enough. And when the snow was falling, I let the snow fall on my head. And it was a beautiful feeling. It's just like going out and like blossoms are falling on your head. And it's a very soft, because snowflakes are very, very light and very uh, fragrant. Not fragrant, but very light and very delicate. So when they fall on your head, it's a very beautiful feeling. I recommend it. I don't think many people are interested. If you went to Norway, you'd probably be wearing many, many beanies and hats and hoods. But it's one of the things which I appreciate, having been a monk for such a long time, is not insulating myself you know, from nature, even just when it rains. It's okay just to let your head get wet and even your robe get wet. It's basically because I grew up like that, you never get colds because, or sick because your, your clothes got wet. They soon dry off again. But what it is doing, you're becoming aware of what it's like to be in nature, the real world. What it's like to get wet. You know that I live in a forest, and in those forests, especially in Australia, there's so many kangaroos. And those kangaroos, I've never seen them hold up an umbrella when it's raining. <laughs> they don't wear a hat on top of their head. They're very happy just getting a bit wet. And they start, actually gives them a wash. I always look forward to the first rains of the year because that's when the kangaroos get a bath. Otherwise, they start smelling. Actually, they don't. <laughs> but anyway, they just be able to feel nature. I think you can become alive. You feel what it's like to have rain on your skin, have snow fall on the top of your bald head. And just allow the wind to wake you up. You know, if you're very dull or sleepy, you go outside and the wind can be quite strong. And it's a beautiful feeling. It's one of those advantages of living in nature. Very recently, if I was teaching a meditation retreat at Jhana Grove, very often I would have to walk from Bodhinyana Monastery to the retreat center. It's only about 600 meters. So it takes, well, at a slow pace, it takes sort of a, about, about 20 minutes. But then at that time of the morning, you could see the dawn come up. Because we, you know, we, we live on a hill, and if we look up to the, the, uh, the east, it's a very clear view of the first light in the sky in the morning. And in the evening, even many meditators, they walk to what they call the lookout. And there you can see the sun go down. And it's a very, it's such a clear air. You always see the sun go down. And there's no sort of buildings which block out the view. And it's a delightful experience. You know, the crimsons and the orange and, and the golds sort of spreading across this time the western horizon. And it's a beautiful thing to experience. So that's one of the wonderful things of living in nature rather than insulating yourself. 
you know, from nature. Yeah, it can sometimes be cold. Yeah, sometimes you can get wet. But just like in life, if you insulate yourself from life, you don't feel anything. Because, you know, you're in sort of a little box called your house. And you go from your box calling your house in your mobile box called your car. And from your mobile box you go to your your box called your office to go to work. <laughs> and you end your life in the wooden box called, <laughs> called your coffee. <laughs> And how much have you actually been in the world in life? Anyhow, that was just making things up as I go along because is the thing working now? Excellent. That's one of the skills you learn as a teacher, how to ad lib. Because sometimes you don't know when the talk is going to start. You don't know when the next part of the event is going to happen. So it's wonderful to be able to just be natural and talk and to be able to connect with people even though you have nothing planned. But anyway, for this evening, there's only about four or five questions. Am I supposed to spend the whole time doing questions or give some advice on meditation? What do you want me to do? Mm. What? Two? Both. Okay. <laughs> At the same time, some instructions, okay. Because uh, the talk I gave at three o'clock, it was just like an introduction, a welcome, and just about precepts and stuff. But never uh, underestimate the power of precepts and also the power of like simplicity, another word for like renunciation. It makes your mind nice and peaceful, and a peaceful mind is very easy to create stillness with. And that's the first thing, if you haven't heard me say this before, or actually you have, many of you have heard me say this before, but you know, we get old and we forget. <laughs> but the most important, one of the most important teachings is that this meditation is a, not about concentration. Concentration is one of those words which I can sometimes, oh, why did they mention concentration? Because if you think this is the learning how to concentrate, then it stops being Club Med Ampang, it becomes Ampang Concentration Camp. <laughs> and concentration is something which you do. It's kind of a bit unnatural, something which you impose on this world. So instead of using concentration, use something much better called stillness. Stillness achieves the same type of goal. You're right there with this moment of being able to be so aware of everything which is happening right now. And concentration means you're forcing that concentration, you're making it happen. And it's also to sustain it takes a lot of effort. Stillness, as you can imagine, it's very relaxing. It is, as I mentioned today, it is the default state of the mind. Stillness. And that is how Ajahn Chah taught. Now, I don't want to just to uh, support my interpretations by quoting my teacher, but nevertheless he gave this wonderful simile of the leaves on a bush or on a tree. And he said, look at those leaves. They're only moving because the wind is blowing. If the wind would stop, those leaves would still move. They've got momentum. But just wait for a few minutes after the wind stops. And because of the friction with the air, those leaves will move less and less and less until those leaves become perfectly still. And it's not that somebody is holding those leaves still. It's not that you're making it happen. It's just the natural state of those leaves. It's not to move. It's only when something outside of the leaves interferes with them. Otherwise the wind blows. 
or someone touches the bush. Only then is there um, the movement. And that's one of the wonderful things I hope each one of you will experience for yourselves. Sometimes your mind gets very, very still all by itself. You think, I never did that. Precisely. You weren't doing anything. And that is why it happens. That stillness, the calmness of the mind. Unfortunately, many of us get a little bit afraid. We think, if I don't do anything, it will get worse. Please, let it get worse. <laughs> then the simile behind that, again, an old simile, but I hope you enjoy this simile. This was not given by Ajahn Chah. This is an original Ajahn Brahm simile of the donkey. You know the donkeys? They used to use them in the old days. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a donkey cart in action. But the donkeys are extremely stubborn. So stubborn, if you get a stick and beat the donkey, the donkey won't move. And that's the wrong way to use a stick. Instead of hitting the donkey with a stick, which is very un-Buddhist, you tie the stick to the donkey's neck, so the end of the stick is two foot in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick, you tie a string. On the end of the string, if you're in KL, maybe you can put a piece of jewelry in. That would not work if you were in Australia. I don't know if you heard. It's a true story. This was at the University of New South Wales. That uh, there was a report of some sort of terrorist incident in one of the university buildings. And so, I think <laughs> that a Victor Wee has heard this before. But it's a true story, and of course I couldn't stop laughing for a long time when I read it. So they had to evacuate this building. It was like one of the student accommodation blocks. Had to evacuate the building, get everybody out. They thought it was a terrorist gas attack. You know, like they had on the Tokyo subway. You know, that, I forget what that gas was, but it would make people pass out. And they had the terrorist... Uh, resp Sorry? Yeah, you remember it now. <laughs> yeah, the, the, so the terrorist response group came in. They sealed the area off, and they went in in their hazmat suits. They were the glasses. <coughs> well, there were people from outer space. And they went in there to find out what was causing this. And they just followed the, the smell, just you know where it gets stronger and stronger, and they isolated. They found out it was in one of the students' lockers. And when they opened the locker, there they found out a piece of jewelry, and, which had been in there for three or four days. <laughs> and that shut down <laughs> the whole of the university, at least that building. <laughs> so be careful. <laughs> but anyway, if it's a fresh piece of jewelry, it doesn't smell that bad yet. So anyway, if you are a donkey from Malaysia, maybe you put a piece of jewelry in front of the donkey. If that was a, a donkey you know, from Australia, you'd put like a carrot in front. I don't know, for in, what would you put for a Mexican donkey? Corn. Okay. So you put a piece of corn in front of the Mexican donkey. So the Mexican donkey looks at a piece of corn. Oh, hey, there's some corn in front of me. Is that what the Mexican donkey would say? <laughs> so the Mexican donkey would start walking towards the, the corn. And when the uh, donkey starts walking towards the corn, the cord goes further away from the donkey because the cord is on the string on the end of the stick. So that means when even the donkey starts to run after that piece of cord, still the piece of cord is always about two foot in front of that poor donkey's neck or mouth or whatever. So it's very frustrating. You can see the piece of cord, you can smell it, it's right in front of you, 
but you can't reach it. Does that ring any bells with your life? Sometimes success, happiness, you know, finding the love of your life, finding a great job, finding peace, happiness, you get so close. But when you go closer to it, that piece of corn goes further away from you. And that's how they get donkeys to pull carts. However, they won't be able to do that much longer in Mexico because once this venerable goes back, he can very easily teach all the donkeys how to catch the piece of corn. It's very simple Buddhist practice. <laughs> that Mexican donkey runs so fast after that piece of corn. It doesn't matter how fast the donkey runs, that corn is still two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. But because of the great instructions by our Mexican monk, that donkey knows how to stop. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't try and concentrate, doesn't try and make things happen, it just stops. And the donkey stops and sees that carrot swing further away because of momentum. This is like when you follow my instructions. Sometimes you think, it's not working, Ajahn Brahm. My meditation is getting nowhere. It's even worse than when I started. Great. <laughs> the, the cord is going further away. And it gets so far away from you, four foot in front of your mouth, thinks the donkey. But the donkey has got faith, confidence. It trusts the Mexican monk. And then, <laughs> then what happens? The corn stops and starts swinging towards the donkey. That's the first time you've ever seen that happen. You're not doing anything. You're just standing there and the meditation is getting better all by itself. You're becoming more peaceful, more aware, more joyful more still. And this uh, piece of corn gets close to you, it gets to its normal place, two foot in front of your mouth. But then it's still got lots and lots of momentum, it's swinging very fast towards you. And that piece of corn gets so close to you, swings out, swings back, right close to your mouth. You must remember the last piece of advice. The last piece of the advice, you've heard me say this many times. The donkey says to that piece of corn, piece of corn, the door of my mouth is open to you. <laughs> so the corn can go in. Otherwise, have you ever seen donkey's teeth? Donkey's teeth are really big. So otherwise it just bounces off the teeth and the donkey's missed its chance. Without that kindness, you get close to stillness, to deep peace, and to you know, really close to seeing things as they truly are, and enlightenment and all of that. If you don't open your heart to what you're experiencing, it bounces off you. And you don't get to eat the delicious piece of corn. That is a very lovely simile, because it's very accurate. And that's actually why, when you're still, sometimes you have to bear with things going a little bit more um, agitated than usual. But just be peaceful, trust, and the stillness will start to come to you. And of course the other simile, which I've used very often, with the water. Um, okay. Um, would you like to come up here? Because you see me do this, but I love doing this with an assistant. Now this is a very trustworthy monk. He teaches donkeys. <laughs> now I'm going to, my goal is to keep the water in the cup perfectly still. 
So can you tell me, has it stopped moving yet? Has it? You know why? I'm not being mindful, am I? I'm not paying attention to this, and so I'm paying attention to it. Has it stopped moving yet? Because I'm not concentrating. I'm not putting right effort into it. Does it stop moving? Now this is not just a joke simile, that many times people think they can't meditate because they're holding their mind, trying to make it still, just like I'm holding this cup, trying to make the water still. You can do this for years and it will never become still. But fortunately, this is one of the easiest things in the world to do and the water becomes still and stays still for a long time. You put it down, you let it go. Once you put it down and let it go, there's a bit of momentum first of all, it's still moving. But now, still. still. You sure? Yes. I'm sure too. <laughs> Thank you. Can I have three sardis? No, not that. Sardi, sardi, sardi. For my assistant today. And if any of you give Dhamma talks, please make it a bit of fun. Have a little bit of silliness, because people remember it then, and they laugh, but also it carries the truth of that simile. So in meditation, to get stillness, we learn how to let things go. And if you say, well that's a nice simile, but how did the Buddha teach? One of the most important parts of the Eightfold Path Second fact of the Eightfold Path, Samma Sankapa. Now sometimes, I know we have Pali scholars here. You've you know, learned a lot of Pali and understood a lot of it. But Sankapa, you might analyze that word and look at how it's used in other contexts. But in the context of the second fact of the Eightfold Path, it's defined quite clearly by the Buddha as Nekama, Awayapada, and Ahingsaka. I mean, we're Hingsaka, but it's the same meaning. And you know what, um, what was it? Uh, the first word is, it's renunciation. And you have seen that here in Malaysia because you use that word when somebody becomes a monk or a nun. They renounce. They're letting go of things, things which they could enjoy, they're just giving up. That is actually what we mean in meditation. We're letting go of things, I'm just putting things down, not holding them, Re releasing them, renouncing the cup. And the second part of that uh, sankapa is, uh, we is Awayapada Sankapa. You know, Awayapada means non sort of ill will, non negativity. It is also used as a synonym for metta, for loving kindness. Now, to me, that was such an important discovery because I was always looking for where on earth is compassion and kindness in the Eightfold Path. And you no, know, I would. I was kind of expected there to be not just some Aditi and some Sankapa. I expected there to be some Metta, white compassion. To me, it was such an important part of what I understood as Buddhism. But I couldn't really see it explained clearly. It was just, oh, there it is. It's like you're looking for something. You know, it must be there, and you find out where it is. There's a second factor. Uh, of the second part of the Eightfold Path, of the um, Eightfold Paths. Loving kindness. So you're kind. And that's an important part of your meditation. Please don't try and force the meditation. Kindness is crucial to your meditation. 
because that kindness creates a lot of the joy of meditation. Have you ever seen great compassionate acts? When people are very, very kind and gentle to one another and they really help you out. That kindness creates joy and energy and power in you. And so when you have that kindness there, you're doing these things, the Sankhapa, you know, for kindness, compassionate actions. And then after the kindness, we get the gentleness. The Ahimsaka is very easy to understand, mostly because that Indian man, Gandhi, that was you know, how he lived his life, of non-violence. And out of that non-violence, he was the one most responsible for kicking my ancestors out of India. Very rightly so. He would never have been able to do that with violence. With non-violence, he defeated the British Empire, which was in India at that time, and they couldn't sort of counter him. And that was an amazing thing which he did. The power of those three things, renunciation or letting go, kindness and gentleness. And that's also just how we live our Buddhist lives, I hope. In all the years that I've been well, practicing and serving and building up Buddhism in places like Western Australia, that's also a creed for my life. You know, the creed of letting go, not trying to get things or own things, but learning how to let go of things. And also, something's happening now, I can't see it, I don't care anyway. Is it aircon or something? Okay. Okay. My life is exciting when you can't see what's going on. But anyhow, as long as there's a, it's not going to fall on me, is it? Oh, what a shame. You know, you don't have much excitement as a monk. So we live a very boring life. But it did happen some years ago. I'm just going off totally on a tangent now. Some years ago, the head of the police force in our area came to see me. And he said, um, I need to talk to you in private. I said, yeah, what's the trouble? Has anyone done anything wrong? Not you guys. You know, we respect you monks. But in the property right next to you, we've discovered the most wanted man in Western Australia is hiding there. We put a, a, a tracker on his girlfriend's car, which has been going up there very often. Not to see you guys, but to see her boyfriend and supply him with food and ammunition. We said we're going to be going in with a SWAT team in a few days' time. We can't tell you when. Ajahn Brahm, you're the leader of this community here. You must keep this secret. When we go in, please tell your monks to stay in their huts because there'll be gunfire. Unfortunately, there wasn't gunfire because actually when they did go in, a few times, I should not rush too far forward. So I had a meeting of all the monks in Bodhinyana Monastery and I said, look, Something is going to happen in a couple of days' time. When it does, stay in your hearts. Don't go out. You know what monks are like. I said, what's going to happen? I can't tell you. If you don't tell us, we're not going to stay in our hearts. I said, look, the, they've told me you have to stay in your hearts. Trust me. I said, well, why? And that's all I could do. It was really hard you know, to get the monks to trust you, and I couldn't tell them what was going to go on. So anyway, a couple of days later, you heard his helicopters coming down and a big shouting and stuff. But what those police did, they were very, very smart. They were waiting in the bushes until this gentleman came out to urinate in the bushes. And they did literally catch him with his trousers down. <laughs> So he couldn't do any resistance. They caught him very easily. And they said it was very good that you monks stayed in your huts because this man was bald. 
So in the helicopters, if they look down from above and they saw a monk, there'd be very little difference between this most wanted criminal and the monks. So anyway, we survived, thank goodness. But that's the most exciting thing which has happened to me in the last 30 years. So, but anyhow, so we don't get into much excitement as monks, but nevertheless, that you know, when anything does happen, we always learn how to practice lots and lots of kindness. And that's how we meditate too. We look at our body and we're kind to it. We're gentle to it. And what Ajahn Chah kept on telling me, he said this so many times. Ajahn Brahm, please meditate not to get things. Do not attain things. But let go of things. You meditate to announce, not to gain. And that was such wonderful advice. You don't try and get these jhanas. You don't try and attain stages of enlightenment. You just see how much you can let go of. How kind you can be and how gentle you can be. And then you'll understand that what these so-called attainments are. They're not stages like getting a degree from university. I don't know, did Ajahn Bamali tell you recently that he was awarded an honorary PhD from Mahajuru Kong University uh, for all the translations he's done of the, of the video. Did he tell you that? Do you know what a PhD means? <laughs> yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> PhD stands for Permanent Head Damage. Well, at least now we've got a doctor in the monastery. So if any man gets sick, you can go and see the doctor. <laughs> He's a doctor of Buddhist philosophy or something. But anyhow. So, that is in the world, attaining things. But in sort of meditation, we learn how to let go of things. How simple we can be. How empty, how peaceful we can be. So that's one of the reasons why with letting go, with kindness and gentleness, how simple meditation can be. It's not about concentration, that's what you do and attain. Stillness is what happens when you don't do those things. And it becomes so beautiful and so natural. That glass of water is still still. It hasn't moved at all. It doesn't tire me out at all. It's a default state. It's what happens when I don't interfere with it. And that's the reason why, for me, it's so easy to meditate. You sit there and just don't do anything. Just be aware and be kind. And it's so beautiful. Now, even just this afternoon, I was tired. The room was hot. I had a little bit of constipation. No, no real constipation, not just mental constipation. And so I just sat down there and just let the body relax to the max. Had a wonderful afternoon. I don't know about you guys, how you went. But then when you have, you know, you keep testing out, this actually works. So often in my life, I am old now, in my 70s, and I do work very hard still. And when you work very hard and you give quite a lot, you do get tired. But honestly, it's not such a problem when you notice how to sit in your room, be still, and see all this beautiful energy start to come up, and you get happy. So that becomes part of the meditation. When you replace concentration with stillness, then you get this beautiful happiness, joy, and clarity come up in your mind. And that's a fun part of meditation. That's when, because you're not wasting your mental energy, thinking, complaining, allowing the mind to wander off here and wander off there, you're keeping it reasonably still, then it energizes the mind. 
even the talk which I gave last night about how to be successful without stress. Remember that example I gave, which I still teach at schools, of how to pass your exams? Before the exam, sit, meditate, don't worry about anything, let go. Your brain needs to be energized. And worrying about things just drains energy. Even when I have to give talks, monks at Bodhinyana Monastery know this, ask Ajahn Brahmali. Sometimes I do get very busy, sometimes if somebody died or you've got to go to a funeral service and on the way back you get stuck in the traffic, you do so many, many things, and then you've got to give a talk. Ah, I'm tired. And by the way, as the monks in front of me know, I never ever plan a talk. That doesn't work. That's looking into the future. I prepare for talks. You know how I prepare for a talk? I sit down, close my eyes and meditate and get peaceful. That's always the best way to plan for a talk. Because when you sort of you touch the Dhamma, it's like you in this you got the you found the well and the bucket and you can take out as much water as you want. You can actually teach the Dhamma that way. So anyway, as we learn how to be still rather than concentrate, that stillness creates joy and happiness and health as well. This is where, when you are meditating in this retreat, I hope you experience these beautiful results of meditation. You open your eyes and you look at the floor in front of you and you see it more beautiful than you've ever seen it before. All those incredible brown colors of the wood. I don't know what type of wood it is, it may not be real wood, it may be plastic, it doesn't really matter. It can appear so incredibly beautiful. This is the nature of stillness. You see more in what you are looking at than you've ever seen before. One of the first times that happened to me as a, a young monk in Thailand during the rainy season, it's very difficult to do walking meditation outside because it's pouring down with rain. So we did the walking meditation inside one of the halls. And as we're doing the walking meditation in the hall, it was a concrete floor, it had no surface to it, just concrete. And the concrete was laid by the lay people, the villagers. I was there when they did it. And they used a lot of spit. And then they tried to smooth it, a bit more spit. It was very unhealthy, you would think, but it was concrete, so it never infected anybody. I don't think concrete carries COVID, does it? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, no one got um, ill from it. But it made a very interesting colours of that concrete. And when you're meditating, walking meditation, you are just walking naturally, not slow, not fast, just however your body wants to, at what speed your body wants to go, and putting your attention just a body length in front of you. And of course I had to stop. I had to stop because the concrete had so many incredible patterns in it. There was light greys, dark greys, medium greys, all types of colours in there. And just it wasn't level, it had contours, it had texture to it. And honestly, I was standing there looking at it, gazing at it, as if it was a work of art. I remember one of my experiences going to Mexico was going to the Museum of Modern Art in there. This was in 1969. I was really impressed that of many countries, the Mexicans were really into amazing modern art. I remember what, that was one of my experiences, I still remember to this day, even though it's over 50 years ago. But anyway, just the modern art which I saw in that concrete laid by villagers, 
in the Wabanana Chao. Please excuse me, that was much better than I saw in the museums. <laughs> Simply because my mind was clear. And as happens so often, you see so much joy and beauty and fragrance and flavor in the food which you eat. Hopefully that happens to you. One of my examples was after doing a personal retreat, which you know, I often do to relax and rest and energize my mind. After the retreat was finished, I went for the breakfast in the morning and they gave me, you know, we've had this over in the BGF the last couple of mornings, they gave me one of my favorite food. It's reasonably healthy, it's vegan. I don't, I'm not a vegan, but you, know, you want to sort of try to do the best you can. And that was baked beans. And then it comes out of a can. And I put one bean, just a single baked bean in my mouth. Wow! That blew all my taste buds. That was the most delicious baked bean. It was covered in this tomato sauce. And when I even bit into that bean, its texture was just so soft. It wasn't like a hard bean. It wasn't just gooey. It was perfect. And I just bit into one bean, and that gave me so much joy and happiness. I thought, I'm going crazy. You get so much happiness out of a baked bean from a can. <laughs> Just one baked bean. And that's what happens. Your mind becomes so strong and beautiful. Weird stuff happens. Don't be afraid. This is great stuff. Your mind is becoming open and sensitive and powerful. And later on, you know, when you start to do the meditation on things like the breathing, Sometimes I wondered when I first started doing this, started meditating, you read some of the instructions, you're watching the breath and Piti Sukha comes up, becomes a delightful, gorgeous breath. What do you mean? The breath is just a breath. I do it every day. <laughs> that's not beautiful. That's not delightful. <laughs> What's it, what are people saying? Then it happens to you. You're sitting here. And you're watching your breathing, say, and you watch the breath go in. Wow, it's gorgeous. It's just like the, the pleasure of a beautiful sunset, or the power of you know, the first light of dawn. You're so sensitive. And the mind can just see so much happiness and joy in whatever you're doing. So that will happen to some of you. The more of you, the better. You start to get into some lovely meditation just before lunch. This always happens on the retreats which I do in, in Jhana Grove. Somebody will always be sitting in that hall when it's time for lunch. With a big smile on their face. And sometimes people think, oh, they must be asleep or they've forgotten it's lunch time. Leave them alone. The joy of your meditation is worth much more than eating your lunch. And it's going to be very conducive to you getting even deeper meditations and greater states of insight too. So this is actually where the joy comes up and it's the joy which allows you to sustain that stillness. You don't do this because you have to it's because you can't resist it. Just like there's a few times on retreats, remember one retreat in Perth, had all these young Thai boys come into the retreat. And I've seen them sometimes in the temple, but not that often. And so many walked into my retreat, and I thought, what's going on? And then someone told me there was a Thai movie star lady who had gone on that retreat with me. They weren't interested in Buddhism. <laughs> they were interested in hanging out with a Thai movie star. Or like one of my other students, she decided to go over to Dhammasala, Dhammasala sorry, over in India to see the 
that His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And because she was, I think, our president at that time or secretary of the BSWA, she used that. And so she got sort of a priority interview with His Holiness. But she had to wait for a couple of days, per, first of all. And because she was a good meditator, she would get up early in the morning and start meditating in the hall. And she was meditating in the hall and she heard that somebody come in and sit next to her. And so, you know, she did a terrible thing. She opened her eyes and looked who it was. Richard Gere. And this wasn't about 20 years ago. Richard Gere is sitting next to me. Oh! And that was the end of her meditation. <laughs> but instead of, you know, some idea of some movie star or some beautiful uh, Thai movie queen, instead, the joy of your meditation is even more attractive. She couldn't watch her breathing anymore because Richard Gere was sitting next to her. That was more attractive. But there comes a time when your breath becomes more attractive than lunch. And people keep sitting there watching their breathing, enjoying every minute of it, even they know they're going to miss lunch. It doesn't matter, it's only lunch. You can get something tomorrow, you won't die. But the happiness and the joy of the meditation is overwhelming. That means this meditation is really going somewhere. And also it gives you the insight as to why people stay as monks for 48 years. When you have that as a joy, instead of the joy of, I don't know what you guys get up to, of course, this is what keeps you going. Actually, more than that, but nevertheless, whenever you want to, you can just sit down in a room, close your eyes, and get in some really deep mistakes. I want you to share that. No reason why you can't. So, but it's not just for the pleasures and the happiness. That really energizes your mind. So you can see the beautiful colors in the wood, you can see the amazing tastes in one baked bean. You can, <laughs> you can hear beautiful sounds in the air corner. It's like a music. I'm not inventing this. That when you really have a strong mind, it's amazing what you can hear, and what you can feel and taste and see. You're getting into powerful mind states, and of course you don't need to, to try anymore. You enjoy every moment of it. That is what keeps your awareness on something like the breath. You just can't take your awareness away from it. It's just too enjoyable. I know that a few people were telling me, apparently yesterday, there was a lot of traffic on the road because apparently there was a soccer match on on the TV. And have you ever seen, maybe some of your the ladies here, seen your husbands watching a soccer match on TV? I don't know, or the ladies watching a movie or something? You ask your, your partner, your husband, darling, it's time for dinner. He doesn't ignore you. He's watching a soccer match. He doesn't even hear you. <laughs> He's way away in the world of soccer. Well, you're watching a movie or something, and you're way away in the world of movies. Hopefully it'd be the case that some of you may be listening to a talk of Ajahn Brahm, and your husband said, time for dinner, and you don't even hear them. That's my fantasy. <laughs> but I still remember going over to, um, what was it, to... Uh, San Francisco to the university over there and for the, the conference at Berkeley and the MC welcomed me and said Ajahn Brahm I have to let you into a secret she said in front of all this packed hall of people waiting for me to speak she said I go to bed with Ajahn Brahm every night I thought, I need a defamation lawyer. I don't, I'm a good monk. 
And then she started laughing and she said, what I mean is I listen to his talks every night when I go into bed. He calms me down so I can get a nice sleep. So that's what she meant about going to bed with me. <laughs> Nothing irreverent. But anyway, what it did was something which was really helpful for her and joyful. And she would do that every night. Why? Because after a while you get very still and you can see the beauty in these things, the joy in them. And it's a natural process. You don't have to do a thing. In fact, the only thing you can do is interfere with the process. And I'll demonstrate what interfering with the process is now. Is the water still yet? Oh no. Because it's still? Oh come on, get still! Look, how many times do I have to tell you, get still? <laughs> can you relate to that? Yourself? How many times you've been meditating? How many years? How many times you've been coming to a retreat? It doesn't work. Come on, be still. Have a good old day, you know. <laughs> Please be patient. Leave things alone. And let the path happen. And this is what occurs that sometimes that you, you think you're not doing anything. And, oh, okay, one of the disciples, she's a nun now. I can't say who she is. Maybe some of you can guess. So this lady, she was meditating on one of the retreats which I was doing over in Phuket, or over in Thailand anyway. And she was really putting a lot of effort into her meditation. She did so many hours of meditating. Until the end of the retreat, she got nowhere. Just frustration. You know what it's like? You think, okay, I'm going to really make it happen. So you come and meditate. You don't miss any talks. You get up earlier than everybody else. You go to bed later than everybody else. You meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate. She got nowhere. But then, that she once the retreat was over, because of her flight back to KL, from Phuket, that she had an hour to kill. That's what she said to me. It's a very bad phrase for a Buddhist to say, an hour to kill. We're not, <laughs> not violent. The same way when people say they're killing two birds with one stone. Please don't say that. That's a lot of thing for a Buddhist to say. I always say you can replace that with you cut two carrots with the same knife. <laughs> or something like Something a bit more appropriate. But anyway, she had an hour to kill, so she went into the hall and meditated. And the first time of the, for the retreat, she wasn't trying to achieve anything. She'd been there, done that, just got frustrated, so just killing time. What a wonderful meditation technique that is. You've got how many days left? Eight days? Just kill time. <laughs> because she never expected anything. She never tried to get anything. And I always remember, <laughs> I can never forget, when I was having an orange juice or something at the table waiting for my taxi to take me to the airport. And she came up to me, bent on her knees, and looked up on me with these really gooey eyes. I don't know if you've had you know, children, like a, say a daughter, and they come up to you, you know, you're the father, and they say, Daddy, I've fallen in love. Oh, it's so wonderful, so beautiful. That's what it kind of reminded me of. This young woman, that she was saying, I don't oh, I don't know, oh. At last, oh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> it was the afterglow of her first deep meditation. That's what happens. She wasn't trying. She'd been chasing the, I suppose for her, a durian 
just for so many days, for eight or nine days, she'd been chasing it, and she gave up. So she stopped chasing, and the jury and came to her. <laughs> right in her mouth. That was a wonderful little story. Uh, but anyway, that's how these things work. They have so much fun and joy. That's why when I said this is Club Med, Ampang, it's much better than Club Med. But at least it gives you a taste of the joy of meditation. And I really just, I will try the best which I can to stop you trying. <laughs> so that you can have this beautiful state of peace. Enough to allow this a beautiful, peaceful, kind, joyful experiences to happen for you. And just that much gives you enormous insights. All the focusing and the trying just makes your ego stronger. Letting go makes your sense of self much, much weaker. Until your sense of ownership is so weak you don't hold anything. You let everything go. You put it down, it becomes still all by itself. These are powerful insights. And this is how it happens. Okay, now that's a little talk about meditation. And it shows you it's, it's easy to meditate. If you have a sore back or sore knees, there's a great invention which was made many years ago which really helps your meditation. It's called a chair. <laughs> so if you are sore, bad back, bad knees or something, please you know, use a chair. You can become inclined on a chair or sitting on a cushion. It doesn't matter as long as your body is comfortable enough to let go. So we only have a few chairs here. But the donation boxes are on a couple of those. So you can kick the donation boxes off and get a couple of chairs to sit in the back or whatever. You don't always have to sit on a chair. Sometimes you can sit in a chair for one session and sit on the floor for another session. It makes it easier on your back, on your knees, on your butt. The only reason I keep sitting on the, uh, the floor is it's the most comfortable for me most of the time. I remember for seven years when I was a young monk in Thailand from 23 to 30, I never sat on a chair once for seven years. I got used to sitting on the floor. So much so that when I got an opportunity to visit my family in London, I got a, I got a, a flight, I think, it was, I think it was Philippine Air or something, cheap airline, economy class. I always remember that time, going to the Perth airport in 19, when was it, 73 or ordained. So 1980 or something. And when I went there, you know, I was fluent in Thai. I could speak Thai like a local. And so when I went to, um, that was in the Don Mern airport, when I went to check in and get the passport examined, I started talking to the immigration official in Thai. He said, you can speak Thai. And he saw I was a monk. We had this wonderful conversation about Dhamma, why is a, Buddha, a Westerner coming to Thailand to become a monk? And then all the other immigration officials, they also came to listen. So they abandoned, each one of them abandoned their post to listen. It was a way in those days because you know, the rules and regulations weren't so strong. Actually, they were still the same, but there was a bit more sort of give and take. So I had all these immigration officials were surrounding me. And the, the man who took me to the airport got really scared that Ajahn Brahm was surrounded <laughs> by all his immigration officials. And so he came up and said, leave him alone, he's a good mark, he's only just going home to see his family, what's wrong? <laughs> and that broke the spell of 
just uh, listening to me give a little brief description of what I was doing. So all the immigration officials went back to their posts and the immigration official who was supposed to be stamping my passport took me inside. The only thing they could give you in those days as a mark of respect was a Pepsi Cola. They bought me one and gave it to me. And then I was sitting down there waiting for the flight. And he came rushing in again. He said, I don't bomb. I forgot to stamp your passport. Can I have your passport back, please? <laughs> but anyway, when he got on the aircraft, I had to sit on a seat for about 16 hours. That was torture. Because I never sat on a seat for such a long time. You know, for nine years. So, it was the opposite. For me, sitting on chairs really hurt. And so sitting cross-legged on the floor was much better. But anyway, that's just what happens. So, please look after your body, be kind to it. And I'll be repeating that again and again and again. There comes a time when you care for your body and the body cares for you. It doesn't cause you any trouble. You care for your mind and the mind cares for you. It doesn't cause you any trouble. I will say much more about this afterwards, about the wandering mind. You know, for years, my mind would wander off, and I'd always try and bring it back again. It would wander off again. It was like a game which I wasn't winning. And then after a while, instead of using like force or willpower, determination, I decided I should use insight. Why was my mind wandering off? Such a simple thing, just watch your breath. What's bad about that? Why do you keep wandering off? And I realized it wandered off because I had a bad relationship with my mind. I was telling it what to do instead of being a friend to it. So once I befriended my mind, if you don't want to watch the breath, that's fine by me. Do whatever you want. There's a kind of letting go of non-controlling. And my mind tested me out for a little bit, wandered all over the place. Okay, that's what you want to do, fine. And I didn't try and bring it back. It was like after a while, my mind and I were kind of testing each other out. And when my mind realized I was its friend, and I wasn't trying to control it anymore, and it stayed with me. We became the best of friends. If you ever notice that, people are really close friends. They stay together and it's hard to, to pull them apart. Maybe you know, your, your wife, your partner, may invite one of your best friends to the house. And they go chatting, chatting, chatting together. You can't get a word in at all. Because these are very close friends. They've got a lot of history behind them, and they just love each other. The experience I had when I was visiting London, I saw one of my old university friends. <laughs> and you know, he, he became a top accountant. Actually, not accountant, an actuary. It was one of the highest paid professions. He was brilliant in maths at Cambridge. And so he got this job, but because he was a student, with me, we were friends. At one time, at one of the parties which we held there, the, you know, he got drunk. He went to the toilet, and when he came out of the toilet, he forgot to put his trousers on. So he came out sort of naked from the, the waist down. And his name was Harold, so Harry for short. So from that day on, he always carried the nickname Flash. Flash Harry. <laughs> when, I met, <laughs> when I met him, he was in a lovely suit because he had a wonderful house, big house, he was quite rich. But anyway, I said to him, Hi Flash, how are you doing? And he said, I don't rob, don't use that word. <laughs> I'm the, the head actor in the whole of Europe. <laughs> and if my friends found out that what I got up to as a student, oh, it'd be very hard <laughs> for me to explain. 
<laughs> even though you know we just had lots of understanding about each other, lots of joy. We spend the next three or four hours just talking non-stop with one another. It's like meeting a good old dear friend I hadn't seen for years. And that reminded me, that's what my mind is like. We can hang out together and basically he can't pull us apart. That's how you get this ability just to be with something like your breath and become so joyful, so happy. It's, it's effortless. So anyway, I keep on talking. So you do have some questions here. So is it okay that do people want a five minute break to go to the toilet? Okay. Please remember that even though you can put your questions in the box there and I don't know who puts them in there, we do have your handwriting on this and I can check it out with your registration forms and find out who it is. <laughs> now I try to keep it anonymous. So the first question is very deep. Why are three bears accompanying Ajahn Brahm for the retreat? For the big bear. Oh, actually, where's the middle bear gone? There's only two bears. I got one over there. Okay. So why are the three bears? The first time that somebody did this was in Hong Kong. He brought his two bears on the retreat. And by the end of the retreat, everybody was borrowing them. And there were some, some very wealthy people on that retreat. And they just made him these incredible offers to buy his bears. Simply because they worked so well for their meditation. They gave you some softness to your mind. For many people, like a teddy bear is non-threatening, it's soft. It can be a symbol of compassion and kindness. And if it is, to put it in your lap makes the meditation go deeper. If you don't believe this, you can try this. Put it in your lap. This one over here is a bit big, but this small one is a really cute one. Put it in your lap. It makes your mind soft, which makes it easy to engage you know, with your body first of all, to relax it and then with your mind to become peaceful. Overcomes fear and the stress which sometimes people have. So. And what is the best way to practice walking meditation? I tend to get distracted as my eyes need to remain open, unlike sitting meditation. Yes, your eyes should be uh, open, but always keep them focused, just the body length in front of you. You don't look to the left or to the right, up or down. Just the body length in front of you is enough to keep you safe. I don't know where you do walking meditation here in this uh, facility. Is there a, a good place to do the walking meditation? Where's that? Oh, just in the corridors, okay. And the spaces between. If you can find a place either in your room or other place where you can do walking meditation, which is not interfering with the other people in this uh, temple, then please do that. It's a wonderful way of keeping your mind calm because you don't have to worry too much about your body and just you know just how it feels no aches or pains and you know as you are walking keep it simple as possible your eyes just um, body length in front of you and just walk naturally and just feel what it's like to walk with mindfulness it's great that we're in sort of a warm country because none of you are wearing socks brilliant Feel what it's like with the skin of your feet on the wooden floor or the other surfaces. And once you become mindful and aware and joyful, just the wooden floor has amazing feelings. And as you move, just notice the way your legs move. Do your legs move straight up, forward and then down again? Of course not, you're not a robot. My legs when they move, 
it goes up and back a bit then it goes forward in an arc and then goes down not straight down but a little arc as well and all the muscles which have to be moved just to do one step it's enormous amounts of movement has to be done now it's not just up and down so many muscles have to be activated you become like a dancer who has to notice some muscles which most people don't even know exist and as you walk it becomes fascinating and you have so much peace and joy for some people honestly they prefer walking meditation they get more deep but mostly it's a great preparation for when you get deep and stood in walking meditation and you go and sit on a cushion and you go even deeper with your eyes closed in sitting meditation what is the difference between Vipassana meditation and the meditation taught by Ajahn? nothing can we promote advertised meditation as a way to train focus and concentration? Now, I don't like the word concentration. There's nothing wrong with concentration, but it's too much force. I would prefer people to say it's a great way to teach stillness, peace, health, joy, freedom, many things. What is the difference between Vipassana meditation and Samatha meditation? I think that may be the question they really wanted to ask. And again, I just quote Ajahn Chah, first of all. He would hold his hand up. Now you can all see the front of my hand, the palm. Now you can see the back of my hand. Now the front, now the back. But even though you can only see the back now, I assure you, and I don't lie, the front of my hand is still there. But the, the back of the hand is in front. Now the front of my hand is leading, and the back of the hand is just behind it. He said, that's like Samatha Vipassana, you can't separate them. You can't have one without the other. And I've, this is not what the Buddha said, but I may have said it somewhere, but I always say you know how much Vipassana, how much insight you have by how calm you can be. The measure of insight is the stillness. You know how still you are by how clearly you can see things. The measure of stillness is a clarity of insight which it creates. And the best quote is from the Dhammapada. Nati janang apanyasa panya nati ajayato yam hi janang chapanya cha sawe nibbana santike. There's no insight without jhana. There's no jhana without insight. In one who has both insight and jhana, you're in the presence of nibbana. And that's how close you are. It's one of my favorite sort of quotes. Okay. Visualization is used during meditation as the way to let go of self by the meditation of aging and death. Will the use of visualization technique make it too powerful that it might cause delusion? <coughs> it could do, because it depends on when you start using visualization. I would prefer for you to get a very still mind first of all, very peaceful, and then when the mind is very peaceful and still, it's less likely to get any delusion. It is the stillness which weakens what we call the five hindrances, which distort wisdom and make you see not what's really out there but what you want to see. Visualization will happen quite naturally you've got your eyes closed you get very still and powerful states of mind the visualization will come up quite easily and have a lot of fun with that <laughs> okay a good example of that is I remember the time when I was meditating once 
actually, that doesn't sound right, does it? We're meditating once, I do meditate all the time. But I was meditating, and this image, you could see it so clearly in the mind, of this monster, with his big bulging eyes, and his mouth open, and, <laughs> and the tongue coming out, you could see the, um, not really teeth, but like fangs. Like, you know, instead of like being horizontal at the bottom, they're all like pointed and like red stuff dripping down from them. And you could see the hair. This was many years ago. This was before they had the punks because all the hair was like pointed at me. And I think many of you know my character. So when I saw this, I wasn't at all afraid, honestly. Instead I thought, if he's going to do this to me, I'm going to respond. So when I responded, first of all, it's big bulging eyes. I put sunglasses on it. Like, you know, that time I used to have Ray-Bans. Remember those sunglasses? Go all the way. So I couldn't see its big bulging eyes. I put a straw hat with a flower coming out on its pointed hair. Its teeth, which all... Uh, um, sharp. I blacked out a few of those teeth like you're a naughty schoolboy, you know, doodling. <laughs> and on the corner of this mouth I put a cigarette. <laughs> oh, it had the necklace of skulls as well. And I put a scarf around it. <laughs> I totally humiliated that monster. It never came back again. <laughs> So when you know what you're doing, these things will never sort of uh, scare you, they'll never sort of distort your, your understanding of what the truth is. You can have a bit of fun and games with them. And sometimes I tell meditators that if you get some interesting experiences coming up, just you're totally safe, just enjoy and have some fun. And one of the those experiences which I had it was, you know, it was a quite a complicated vision. It just comes up by itself. But I was having a psychic battle, you know, with this uh, Indian uh, magician. And we were flying through the air. No, this, this was only the vision. I wasn't really flying through the air. Zapping each other. Zap, 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 zap. This is not Harry Potter. It was years before Harry Potter. I don't know if Harry Potter does zap people through the air or not, I'm not quite sure, I've never seen that. But anyway, zapping each other. And it was really good fun. Remember you're a monk who doesn't watch movies, doesn't watch the TV, so it can be boring so you can make up your own little... But because it was my vision, there's one thing you should always know, in your visions, you always end up winning. Because it's your vision. <laughs> I just had a bit of fun and games for a while. And another time, more recently, I was meditating and had this vision came up of, uh, it was like one of these, what we call the nimitas. And you knew it was a nimitta because it was a yellow color, but a more pure yellow than you ever see in the real world. Like it was more yellow than yellow. And that's typical of these visualizations which happen uh, when you get very strong nimitas. But then, instead of just focusing on just a beautiful color, I focused on the shape of that um, yellow image. And I recognized it straight away. You may know that I sometimes look at newspapers, but I usually look at the cartoons. And that image, I recognized it pretty quickly, was Garfield the cat. <laughs> you know Garfield? And as soon as I recognize this idiot of a monk making a, a Garfield limiter, I just burst out laughing. And that was the end of that meditation. <laughs> and I'm the only one in the world who's had the Garfield limiter. <laughs> but you're not scared, so whatever happens is fine. So the visualizations is to let go of self by the meditation of aging and death. 
a lot of times people think they're contemplating aging and death and when it starts to happen they get really scared they're not going deep enough it's not powerful enough to actually to overcome the aging, the fear of aging and death that has to be overcome by getting so still your mind is powerful it's not scared of anything I still remember one of the stories my preceptor told me the preceptor was Somdep Buddhajan in Watsaket and I always thought that he was a very brilliant scholar but I never knew about what he'd done in meditation before but then when I had a time to chat with him once, just the two of us he said that when he was trained as a young monk it was in uh, Gotsamoy you know the island which is now like a, a resort place for travelers but that's where he grew up and he says his teacher told him to go into like a coconut grove sit down and meditate and he did, he had a very good meditation that time a couple of hours when he came out of his meditation and opened his eyes he saw a very dangerous snake crawled up in his, lake, in his lap it was a venomous snake it was like quite aggressive usually it was crawled up in his lap and he said the most amazing thing was he wasn't at all scared he just had compassion for this little snake crawled up in his lap so he closed his eyes and just said you can stay there as long as you like and after about 20 minutes the snake uncoiled and, and slithered away and he said for him that was kind of unbelievable that he could have a snake very dangerous on his lap and he wasn't at all afraid he said normally he'd be really so afraid he'd run the other way very fast but because of the meditation the fear had disappeared for a while that's what happens Dear Ajahn Brahm, it's so wonderful to see you again in Malaya after two years and attending your online retreat. Thank you for coming to lead the retreat for us again. I have a friend who's struggling with failing treatment for cancer. How can I best support her? Failing treatment? Sometimes I don't really believe in like failure, but if they're being got a cancer, what Ajahn Chah told me once when I had scrub typhus I didn't know what it was he said, Brahm you'll either get better or you'll die but it won't last you understand? she has cancer sometimes you know, if you do something wonderful really relax and let go sometimes that cancer can go into remission but then sometimes people die what's wrong with that? death is part of life so if that happens for her, I don't know exactly what her state is please tell her you know, just be kind to your body you know, care for things but sometimes with cancers people interfere too much and sometimes the treatments can be so so terrible that it sort of weakens the body and you've got no oomph in you to, to actually deal with that cancer but please never fight cancer because fighting with it is too negative no, make peace with it, renounce, be kind, be gentle same way the meditation works and if the karma is enough then sometimes you go so deep into meditation you come out the other end and the cancer has gone life is very weird this, uh, our local doctor in Serpentine, that's where I live is uh, Dr. Brian Walker the reason I mention his name is because he is a Buddhist and the reason why he's a Buddhist was that he was a GP in Hong Kong a few years ago and one of his patients was this Indian lady living in Hong Kong called Anita Murajani 
And if you remember that name, it's because she had such terrible cancer that they had so many operations on her and on the last operation the doctors basically they lost her they thought she'd totally gone but then she could describe what happened in her near-death experience floating up to this light going right inside the light because she was a Hindu she described it as uh, being with God pure love for me, I know that as like a first jhana experience. And when she came out of that, she had the insight. The insight she had was the cause of her cancer, which was always trying to prove herself to others, trying to please others, stressing herself up out because she never thought she was good enough. And that was causing that very profound inner stress which made her have this cancer and so when she opened her eyes she came out from the anesthetic and I was quite surprised the doctors there the first thing she said was my cancer is cured and they thought she was crazy she still just come out from the operation she hadn't got her full capabilities of sensibility left but it was true she knew that cause was trying to please other people, work so hard to try and make other people happy. That was stressing her body out and her mind out way too much. And so she started to not be so worried about how other people felt about her. And she made full recovery. She had all these amazing sort of interviews you know, on TV and wrote a book, I think it's called Dying to Live. And the weird thing is, you know, that's a wonderful book, but her GP is now my GP. I hardly ever go and see him. <laughs> but nevertheless, he's on, my name's on his books. He's the, the doctor who looks after the monks and serpentine. I don't know how this happens. Coincidence or what, I'm not sure. Anyway, so, Cancer is a word, not a sentence. See what happens. By nature, my back is not straight. I'm slightly hunched. Over the years, I have a problem keeping my body straight throughout meditation, as I find it disruptive each time. I straighten my back and my body continuously slouches slowly during meditation. What should I do? Slouch, for goodness sake. Let your body decide what it needs to do to be comfortable. Trying to have this idea of a perfect posture for meditation is ridiculous. I already mentioned the time I had scrub typhus. It's the same symptoms as typhoid. And because they didn't know exactly what it was at the time, they, they shot my backside up twice a day with a blood needle, with all sorts of antibiotics. I'm supposed to be a kind monk, but honestly, I confess, the nurse who injected me in the morning and in the afternoon after about three weeks my butt was so sore I just, I just could not at the time give any loving kindness to that nurse <laughs> it really hurt and they say Ajahn Chah came to see me oh great you'll either get better or you'll die thank you the worst part of that, you can argue with it. That was just so, such good dhamma, but it's not what I wanted. So I remember one morning or afternoon, I can't remember what, I decided I felt so, I never felt that weak in my life. Just no energy at all. It was just hard to, didn't even have bedpans. So you had to get up and, and lurch to the next bed, get your energy back again and just get to the toilet. When you went to the toilet, the squat toilet, you spent as much time in there as you possibly could because you didn't want to do that more than once a day. But anyway, it felt so weak and nothing was working. So I decided, meditate. There's no way I could sit up and cross my legs. So I just, wherever I was uh, 
laying down on the bed, I just closed my eyes and just started to let go. And honestly, that really shocked me. I got into a beautiful meditation, lovely meditation. Even though the body was had no energy, probably had a fever at the time, but certainly ached. And just enjoyed a beautiful sense of stillness. When I came out afterwards, one thing I noticed was my posture. I had just come out of a very deep meditation. I've never seen that posture in any meditation book in my life. One leg was this way, another leg was that way, an arm over here, an arm over there, twisted all over the place. As if you ever seen a person with a fever in hospital, the leg, the arms and legs and back are all over the place. That's what my body wanted to do. I had enough wisdom to be kind to my body. If that's how you want to uh, lay down, fine. You're in charge, you know better than me. And I just let my body go. I got into a wonderful meditation. And that really taught me, you don't need a straight back to get into the deepest of meditations. You don't have to have your legs in this position or that position. You can even sit against the wall and put your legs out. If it's comfortable and you can let the body disappear, great. So this is like personal experience which I, I use to try and encourage you to be kind to your body. But some of the weird things is if, you, if you've got like a hunched body, many times I, I notice this, I let my body just hunch over. And I was not very mindful to begin the meditation, but the mindfulness started to increase. And as the mindfulness increased, my body straightened up all by itself. And I was clear enough, I never gave that instruction. Trust your body, it knows better than you. And sometimes it will straighten itself up or it will twist around. Your body knows what to do. Trust it. How to stop comparing with others? Just keep your eyes closed, you don't know what they're doing. I don't know. I know that when we used to do this walking meditation, even when I was a monk, sometimes I would see who could be the slowest. <laughs> Almost like a competition. And also when I was a monk, I remember just teaching these retreats and I made a resolution. I'd be the last person to leave the meditation hall in the evening. So after, you know, whoever monk was teaching the retreat had stopped talking, and a few of us would carry on meditating. And every 10 minutes I'd open my eyes. Crikey, they're still there. Who do they think they are? <laughs> and then you'd hear someone get up. Oh, good, she's gone. Now who else is left here? <laughs> and that's totally ridiculous. You know, trying to increase your personal best. It's not best, it's worst. So after a while, you don't compare yourself to anybody. Why? Because there's no one in here to compare it to. You know, that's why Ajahn Chah kept on saying, there's no Ajahn Chah, there's no Ajahn Brahm, there's no Datuk Victor Wee. That's just, you know, so how, how can you compare? Impossible. So after a while, don't compare yourself with anybody. Just disappear. Please advise how to reduce sloth and torpor. Easy, go to bed. <laughs> a lot of times, the first days of a retreat, people have sloth and torpor because they are sleep deprived. And I think a lot of you, I say this, I know Singaporeans are just about 99% of the population are sleep deprived. In other words, you know, you, you work so hard, you've got your social life, you've got other things you have to do, and so, you know, you are sleep deprived. So you come on a retreat, and if the monk 
or teacher is wise enough, they tell you, please sleep in if you need to. Don't try and be the first person up in the morning or the last person here at night. That's crazy stuff. Especially for the first three or four days. And my example of that is this, oh, this very wise executive from Sydney. She arrived at my retreat. This was held in Sydney in the middle of the night. So she didn't check in because she had to finish off all the loose ends before she could come on the retreat. So she, I gave her a special interview on the first morning, which was a Saturday morning, and she told me just how stressed out. It was obvious, you could see it on her face and everything. And I told her, look, the first few days, you sleep as much as you need. And she had enough confidence in me. She was Australian, Caucasian, and had enough confidence in me that as soon as I gave her that advice, she went straight back to bed. She got up for lunch. After lunch, she went to bed. She slept until the, the afternoon, and she got up for the evening talk. After the evening talk, she went straight back to bed. She did that for the first three days. And in the interview, she said, because I was staying in dormitories, I think, sharing about 40 a room. She said, all the other ladies in my dormitory, they're looking at me, they can't speak, but you can see, they think I'm just taking up a bed for no real use, that I'm just sleeping all day. And they're so angry at me. And I said, they're not angry at you, madam. They're jealous. <laughs> they wish they could have the guts to do that. And so she slept a lot those first three days. The next three days, you know, she, her sleep was back to normal again. So she did a lot of meditation and she soon caught up with the others. The best thing was by the end of the retreat, she was a star meditator. She had so much energy, so much peace and stillness. She was kind to her body because her body needed it. And then the body started cooperating with her. And they had wonderful meditations together. Her body and her mind. If stillness is the default state, how did it diverge in the first place? Because somebody told you at school, work hard. I remember the time sometimes people asked me, my lay name was Peter. Peter, what do you think about that? Nothing. And they thought you were stupid. I could have been a monk so much earlier, much better meditation, if my teachers didn't tell me to keep thinking. <laughs> and keep doing stuff. You're lazy. I'm not lazy, I'm just renouncing. <laughs> it's our culture does not admire stillness. Even Christianity say the devil makes work for idle hands. So do something. Don't be lazy. It's not being lazy. It's being wise and kind. So our society makes us do too much. And a lot of times we are judged by how much we do. Oh, he really works hard. Oh, he really studies well. They push you. That's part of the world. I know that some people say, you can't live in the world without putting effort. Yeah, you've done that. You've all done a lot of skillful work in the past. But right now you're on retreat. You are not going to be measured by how many hours you sit here. Just one nice meditation of the whole eight days that will blow your mind. Well done. People just sit here hour after hour after hour after hour after hour. You just get tense and more tired. And if you go home more stressed out than when you first came here, what's the point of this retreat? I used to notice that. On some retreats they used to take the group photograph and all these people were looking very happy on the group photograph. And I said, well, that's taken at the end of the retreat. That's why they're so happy. They're going home in an hour's time. 
if people take the group photograph in the middle of the retreat, that's a bit more honest. <laughs> so, are you happy now? Honestly? No, you're not. You're tired, you're just starting. So just wait, and the happiness will come up and look after your body, look after your mind, give it what it needs. Last question. Over the last four to five years I meditate almost daily, but I can't meditate beyond 45 minutes. I feel I don't progress. Look, stop thinking about progress. If you want to progress, you just go backwards. You don't progress, you ingress. You go deeper in to what you're experiencing now. You don't go on to the next thing. And stop judging yourself. Sometimes you do 45 minutes and that's all you ever do because you're too aware of time. Instead you just sit down there, don't even have a clock, and just see what happens. I don't know how many times people have said this. We're meditating, not worried about the time. And they meditate and meditate, they have a nice peaceful meditation, they open their eyes, the clock must be wrong. It can't be three hours. They look at the clock, and it was three hours. They have these incredibly long meditations, they feel wonderful, they feel great. How on earth did that happen? You haven't been asleep, you've been very peaceful. And what it meant was that you actually understood what meditation is, you got beyond the prison of time. An hour, 45 minutes, two hours. I'll finish off with one of my favorite stories. There was a retreat being held in Sydney by a Theravada Vietnamese monk. And they started off with, you know, the orientation, giving people the briefing of what they can do, what they can't do, and giving precepts and stuff. And then the monk said, we know we'll have the half an hour meditation before he gives his talk. And after half an hour, when everyone was meditating together, the monk never opened his eyes. He just carried on meditating. After an hour went past, two hours went past, the monk was still meditating. And so everybody, they were tired, they went back and went to sleep. When they got up in the morning, the monk was still meditating. It was time for the morning chanting, the monk was still meditating. But it was time for their, their breakfast, all the lay people went for their breakfast, the monk just sat there. He sat there for eight days, never moved. Never went to the toilet, never had anything to eat or drink. They were watching him all the time. And after eight days, he finally opened his eyes and told everybody, I'm sorry, I should have been giving you some talks and the chanting and some interviews. And all the people who witnessed that retreat said, No! That was amazing! That was so inspiring to see that that's still possible in today's world. That someone can just sit still like that without needing to do anything. Thank you. The inspiration was so great. That's actually sometimes what happens. Time loses its meaning. And you're free from the prison of time. You can be peaceful and enjoy this timelessness. What was interesting, it was eight days. Usually in the suttas it says only seven days you can do that. I don't know, but that's what they said. So, that's a good personal best. See if you can beat that. <laughs> okay, any questions from the floor here before we finish off for the evening? No? Okay. Okay, so it's now 20 past nine, so it's a time now that we can all go and have a good rest. I'll see you all in the morning time. Those of you who are the uh, smart Alex who want to carry on <laughs> meditating, you can do if you wish. If you want to go to have a nice sleep, please have a nice sleep. And we'll see you all in the morning.
Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you.